Hi friends, welcome to another edition of First Chapter Friday. I hope you enjoyed the last book I read, which was Greystone Secrets, The Strangers. This Friday we'll be reading The Elephant's Girl by Celesta Remington. It states, the synopsis states, an elephant never forgets, but Lexington Willow can't remember her past. Swept away by a tornado as a toddler, she was dropped in a nearby Nebraska zoo where an elephant named Naya protected her from the storm. With no trace of her family, Lex grew up at the zoo with her foster father, Roger, her best friend, Fisher, and the wind whispering in her ear. Years later, Naya sends Lex a telepathic image of the woods outside the zoo. Soon, Lex is wrapped up in an adventure involving ghosts, lost treasure, and a puzzle that might be the key to finding her family. Can Lex summon the courage to discover who she really is? and why the tornado brought her here all those years ago. Okay, I am gonna read a few chapters in this book because the first chapter is only two pages long. <laughs> so chapter one, the wind in the zoo. The wind and I have a complicated relationship. Because of the wind, I'm the girl without a birthday, without a name, without a beginning to my story. See, the wind took my family away when I was small, and I don't remember them or where I came from. I've tried asking the wind for my family back, but it isn't a very good listener. It does most of the talking. It whispers things only I can hear, reminding me that ghosts are real and elephants can speak. But even though I can hear the wind's words, and even though it follows me around and tries to give me advice, the wind can never make up for taking my family away. The way I figure it, the wind owes me big. At least it left me in a place where I could have a home. Roger Marsh, the zoo's train engineer, found me in the Lexington Zoo after the biggest storm Nebraska had seen in nearly four decades. I've been here with Roger ever since. A few things happen when I tell visitors that I live in the zoo. First, they laugh a little. It's usually one of those brief explosive laughs, but after a while they realize I'm not kidding. Then comes the following in this order. One, they stop laughing. Two, they look me up and down. Three, time passes like a snail while they consider whether or not I'm a rare breed of monkey. I don't know who my parents are, but I'm definitely not a rare breed of monkey. And despite the elephant girl chant the kids at Lexington Elementary repeated when I used to go there, that's not who I am either. Roger was checking the zoo's train tracks for damage when he found me. He had some help though. He says a ghost saw me wander into the elephant habitat after the tornado hit the city and the ghost showed him where to find me. Roger, who clearly believes in ghosts, thinks I might have been five when I showed up at the zoo. And since I've lived here for seven years, we've decided I'm 12. He named me Lexington. <clears throat> Chapter two, the old county bank. The zoo train is a genuine Union Pacific steam locomotive, so running it is a bigger job than you might think. Sometimes I help Roger in the train shed where he maintains old engine 109. He's taught me about the tools he uses. I even try to hand him what he needs, although the wrenches used to tighten bolts on a steam train are half as tall as me. I also help Roger by taking tickets, cleaning picnic tables, and sitting in the caboose to give the train speech. He has a fireman who shovels the coal and fills the boiler, and he is a part-time locomotive crew, but Roger says I give the best train speech. Today is the first day of summer vacation for my friend Fisher, though I'm going to need the day off. Hey Roger, I call to him from the staircase, waving my borrowed copy of Island of the Blue Dolphins at him. Roger looks up from his latest book in Oatmeal. He's reading a psychology book this time which is a weird change from his usual history choices. He has to shift in his chair to see me. The living room between us is taller than it is wide, and Roger's place at the kitchen table is partly hidden behind what used to be a bank teller's counter. The engineer's resi residence at the Lexington Zoo was a county bank in 1907. Roger's eyes widen when he sees the book in my hand. The constant creases across the suntan forehead fold up in deeper lines when he does this and his teeth flash white when he smiles. You finished it? Yep, 
This was my last assignment from Mrs. Lee to finish my sixth grade work. I'm done. Our voices echo in the center of the old county bank. The zoo paid to have the place fixed up like a house, preserving much of the historical stuff, of course. Roger did a lot of the work himself, more since I came to live here, but he couldn't upgrade the echo out of the place. Just in time, too, I say, weaving around the teller's counter <clears throat> and plopping into the chair across from Roger. Fisher's vacation starts today. Roger reaches, reaches across the table and pats my pale, freckled hand with his tan one. His hands are always warm, and he almost always knows what I'm thinking. Ah, yes, he says, elephant training. Spending time with the elephants, one elephant in particular, is the thing that's going to make this summer great. Having my best friend finally out of school and in the zoo all day with me is going to make it even better. Yes, Mr. Lee said we're old enough to help this summer so long as we do it together. And so long as Thomas is there, right? I nod. Thomas O'Connell is the elephant manager. He handles all their training, which keeps the elephants busy and allows Thomas to check their health, especially their feet. <clears throat> the elephants can choose whether or not to come into the training barn, but since they get apples and sweet potatoes for rewards, they all seem to enjoy it. Roger slides a bowl of oatmeal in front of me. I know you're excited, but eat first. I shove a spoonful of grayish purple oatmeal into my mouth. Roger likes to put blue blueberries in it, and they dye the whole batch. I suppose you should take some time off from the station then. Do you have enough people today without me? I ask. He smiles again and says, I think we can make it work. Roger taps Island of the Blue Dolphins on its cover. Aren't you supposed to write a report on this? Done. I finished it up this morning. I can give it to Mrs. Lee when I go see when I go to see Fisher. Roger scrapes the last of the oatmeal from his bowl and takes it to the sink. His overalls rustle when he moves, and his big work boots clomp on the tile floor. It's a good thing the old county bank has high ceilings, or Roger might be crowded. Fern and Gordon probably have some chores for Fisher, he says, scrubbing his bowl in the oatmeal pot. So you help him if he does, okay? Fern and Gordon Lee are Fisher's parents. They all live in the zookeeper's residence on a gravel road near the African grasslands. Fisher's dad is in charge of all the keepers at the zoo, and that means he's the one who makes sure the animals have the best possible care. So they live in a residence on the property, like Roger and me. Of course, I say, I always help Fisher with his chores. Helping the zookeeper's son with his chores is not exactly what I call work, especially since he's my best friend. Meet me for lunch, okay? Of course, I say, again. I always meet Roger at the Wild Eats Cafe for his noon lunch break. I join him at the sink and fill a large water bottle for each of us. Nebraska is hot in June. Chapter 3, The Lees. The walk to the Lees house is, an all uphill, is all uphill since their house is halfway to the main entrance, which is the highest point of the zoo. The Old County Bank is near the main train station, which is the lowest point. I feel like I know every inch of the zoo, not only from hiking it every day, but because of Roger's train speech. I've given it so many times, I have all the facts memorized. I can tell you that everything inside the perimeter fence is 130 acres. We have the largest aviary in the world, the second largest indoor rainforest, and over 900 animal species. In seven years, I've never run out of new things to see. If this were a school day and I didn't have Fisher here, I'd stop at the Swift Aviary to check on the flamingo babies and then head straight for the field behind the African grasslands. A few years ago, Roger built a tree house in a tall maple tree where I can watch the elephants. The tree house was Roger's way of letting me see the elephants whenever I wanted because until today, I wasn't allowed inside the training barn without Mr. Lee. And Frank Bixley, general manager, said I should stop distracting the keepers but he didn't really like the idea of the treehouse. Frank Bixley has never seemed too happy about me living at the zoo. He likes things to be orderly and predictable, and I am neither of those things. But since today is the first day of Fisher's summer vacation, I take a quick peek at the flamingo babies through the aviary netting and skip the treehouse altogether. I, hiked, I hike the paved road past the African grasslands 
and take a swig from my water bottle. The wind checks in as a light breeze, whispering through my hair, tickling my ear. Maybe she won't come into the barn today, says the wind. It knows the elephant I most want to see. It also knows Frank Bixley has kept Naya and me apart since the night of the tornado. Sometimes I wonder whether Frank Bixley and the wind are friends. She will. She'll come, I answered my head. Ever since the incident at Lexington Elementary, I've chosen to answer the wind in silence rather than out loud. I skip over the first two steps in front of Fisher's house and jump straight to the porch with a thud. Fisher hears me land by the door and opens it, propping the screen door open with his foot. He's wearing a white and blue Omaha Storm Chasers jersey and holding a bowl of cereal. Hey Lex, he says with a bright smile that says he knows how excited I am about today. I'm almost finished. He takes a big spoonful of his Cap'n Crunch. He probably got a box from the guys on the grounds crew. His mom doesn't usually buy that stuff. I'm guessing by the amazing smell of curried onions in the Lee's house that Fisher's mom already made him a warm breakfast. Mrs. Lee learned to cook from her Thai, grandma, her Thai mother, Fisher's grandmother, who came to America when she married Mrs. Lee's American father. You can't find anything as good as Mrs. Lee's food. I don't know why you'd ever choose Cap'n Crunch when you have curried onions and omelets as an option, I say. Hey, just because my mom makes Thai food, he said with his mouth full, doesn't mean I'm not going to want sugary cereal once in a while. Oh, I say. Do you want to come in? Fisher asks. Yep, I say. I have an assignment to turn into your mom anyway. I wave my typed double-spaced pages. I may have widened the margins a bit to make my report look longer. Just a bit. I'm not hanging around for that, Fisher says, raising an eyebrow. She might get some ideas and make me write a paper. I've already had a list of chores from my dad this morning. I would have helped you, I say, stepping inside and catching the screen door before it slams. Mrs. Lee always asks us, asks us not to track the zoo into her living room, so I pull off my tennis shoes by the pair of teakwood elephants facing the doorway. The statues are Asian elephants, so they have smaller ears and smaller tusks than Naya. Their trunks are raised upward and they face the door for luck and success. I think it's a good sign I'll see Naya today. Fisher swallows another bite and shrugs. I'm finished mostly. How about I meet you at the elephant barn when you're done? Okay, but I really think it's just going to take a minute. Lexington, Mrs. Lee calls from her home office. Come on in. Fisher gives me a look that says he's glad his mom isn't his school teacher and disappears into the kitchen with his bowl. So those are the first three chapters of The Elephant's Girl. If you liked the beginning of this book, come on in and check it out. And if you like ebooks or audiobooks, we there's um, they are both on our Overdrive app. Till next time.